What's good, MMA fans? It's about time to react to the first pay-per-view card of the year. And fuck me, what a crazy card this was. I was going to actually do a little setup and talk about what a bang average piece of shit card it was, but I'm too tired, it's six o'clock, and I can't even be bothered to fuck around. Um, so I'm just going to get straight into the action. Um, this one might take a little while because I think there's about 15 fights to cover, but let's just get into this. Okay, so the first fight was between Oliveira and Marcos. Now, I didn't include this one in the build-up as I didn't really know that much about Oliveira. I'd never really encountered him before, but I'm going to react because I'm a goddamn professional out here. Okay, so... Oliveira came out pretty aggressive from what I can remember, uh, but it seemed to be a little bit of a mismatch right from the start. Um, for starters, I've never seen anybody attempt so many spinning back fists in my life. He must have attempted at least 10. Um, the first few minutes was spent against the cage mostly and was pretty forgettable. Uh, Oliveira was showing really bad technique, especially in the shooting, like he was shooting from really far out, and I was convinced he was going to catch a knee right to the face coming in. I'm surprised this guy has such a good record, actually. I think he's like, yeah, he's 18 and 4. I forgot I've got it right there on the screen. Um, anyway, the fight made it to the second, and Marcus's quality just took over. He started investing a lot to the body. And it really started to pay off. Uh, at one point, Oliveira got hit with a really bad knee. And that was just the beginning of the end. He took it right right to the liver. Uh, at first, actually, I thought it was a nut shot. But the way that he fell, you know, by the way that he fell, but it was really clean. Uh, he doubled over, got a few more extra shots just for good measure. But the ref jumped in and stopped it. So it was a decent fight to the card. Nice win for Marcos. I don't know if we'll be seeing Oliveira again. So Marcus won that one by TKO. Now the second fight was between Josian Nunes and who I thought was going to be the sacrificial lamb. But this fight really surprised me a little. Now I spoke a lot in the prediction card about how awkward uh, Nunes is in there. And this really played out that way. Like first round she got picked off at range a lot. And took some really nasty and hard shots throughout. She clearly lost the first round. And the odds dropped really hard as a result of that. So I'm already really concerned at this point. Now the second was actually a little bit more of the same. But the difference was that Fern was starting to run out of steam a bit. Uh, not surprising I guess considering she was out of the cage for a while. Now she had a few more significant moments but... Nunes, I think, kind of edged the second round by being far more active. I can see why the judges felt that way. Like Fern, I think, had the slightly better moments. But it was the activity, I think, that won Nunes the second round. And then the third round came around and, fuck, it looked like amateur hour in there. You know, both women were swinging wildly, scrapping hard. Uh, Nunes had the slight better of it, I guess. I couldn't honestly call this one by the end, but as the home girl, as in Nunes being in Brazil, I figured she would win. A unanimous decision really surprised me, and I feel dirty for taking this one, but I'm owed it after the uh, female shit show from the last card that lost me one. So that took me to 1 0 to start the card off. Nice start. Now, the next fight was Alves versus Dalby, and I called Dalby to win this one barely, and I got it exactly right. Both men came into scrap, and that's exactly what we want, what we got. Um, Alves started out with some really nice body work, and both were trading in the pocket a bit. And as the round progressed, Dalby started investing more to the body, getting knees in the clinch, and he looked really, really strong there. Most significant thing that happened in the round was the accidental headbutt that caused damage to Dalby's face. It was a fairly even round, and I felt Dalby edged it, but 
given the damage and the fact that the headbutt wasn't called, I wouldn't have been surprised if they called that first round for Alves, which I think is what ended up happening. Now, the second and third round were quite similar in that Alves was having slightly better moments, with Dalby being visibly busier, busier and making you know smarter choices. He was changing it up. He was working the body and legs to throw Alves off, and then he caught him coming in at times. Now, the weird thing about Dalby is he, he kind of blows like really hard in there, like he's breathing hard and heavy and constantly, which seems odd, but it seemed to keep him moving in. He didn't really seem gassed, despite giving the appearance that he might have been gassed. So the fight was a nice scrap. It was very close. It was defined by the busier man, Dalby, changing things up, working the jab and knee clutch as well. I didn't really agree with the split decision. I thought it was a UD. But I called it correct on both counts. And Dalby won it by a close decision, a split decision. So that took me to 2-0. and oh. And I'm starting to get that similar feeling I had in the last card where good start. Let's see where it goes. Now, then we came up against Bonfim, against McKinney. Now, holy fuck. First off, let me say, I took a punt on the underdog Bonfim on this one. And shit, did it pay off. 80% of Tapology had McKinney in this one, but not your boy here. Uh, to be fair, Terence started out pretty confidently, and he looked like he was reasonably comfortable in the opening 30 seconds. From that point on, though, Bonfim kind of took over, and I was really not expecting that. I thought Terence was going to have the first round, and then Bonfim would take over, but that's not how it played out. Now, Terence lost his mouthpiece at the midway point of the first round, and it did turn out to only be a glancing blow. So it wasn't as important as it first appeared. Then as the rounds went on, Bonfim seemed to be respecting Terence's power less and less. And I was beginning to feel more and more confident of my pick as the round went on. Now Bonfim ended up managing to control most of the round and had the better moments. It was a very clear first round for me. And McKinney looked really, really rattled in the corner. Now this is when I expected Bonfim to really take over. And he certainly did, but not in the manner that I was expecting. It was clear, like, as the round kind of started, that Bonfim was patiently taking his shots and that he just didn't respect McKinney in there anymore. Then, at some point in the midway of the second round, he hit McKinney with a really nice right that dropped his mouth guard out, mouth guard out again. And for some reason, it was at that moment, I just thought, this is over. Ah... Uh, so a moment later, Bonfim got in really close. He avoided a blow and then hit him with a really, really just lovely fil and filthy switch knee to the head. And M M McKinney went down like a ton of bricks. I I we didn't see him leave the cage. It was a brutal KO. I didn't expect Bonfim to win in that manner. But it was an impressive and dominant performance. I think Terence is going to have to take a long time off and rebuild because he got battered and he was the favourite. And this took me to a clean 3-0. and oh. So looking hot as fuck so far, just like the last card. Now, the next fight was between Cody Stamen and Lacerda. Now, Stamen was a huge favourite in this one. Most bookies had him at minus 350, minus 400, which means, you know, you need $4 or four pounds to get you one. So, Stamen was massively favoured here. Uh, now, the first round was, it was very clear that there was going to be a massive style difference between the two. Like, the Serta was planting down his feet. Stamen was bouncing around and looking elusive. The Serta was kind of picking his shots, kicking hard at the legs and body. So the fight stayed on the feet as I predicted in the first round. Cody looked a lot faster in there, but Lacerda had the better and clearer moments for me. Uh, Cody did end the round stronger, but it was a very tough one to call. And what was really strange about that is Stamen's co corner immediately told him he'd won the round, which is, to me, always a really fucking dumb thing to do. Um, especially when one's pretty close. You say, you know, a good corner will say... 
pretty close round. You might have edged it, but, you know, let's pick it up. So anyway, round two was definitely more in Cody's favor. Uh, Lacerda did manage some decent body work. But Stamen was looking slicker on the feet, a little bit more elusive. He was faster. And he was doing some excellent body work up close, which I personally always love. I'm a big fan of body work. Uh, now, at that point in the second round, Lacerda looked like he was gassing quite a bit. And Stamen was working the body fast and hard, especially towards the end of the round. So for me, that was a clear Stamen round. And I had it at 1-1. Now, the... The third was odd because Stamen basically fought it like he was 2-0 up. Now, I was thinking at the time, this is not a smart move. So, just a little bit into the round, Lacerda manages to double leg him and take him down. And he had really strong control time from, time from there. He landed nice shots on top. And I'm thinking, holy shit, another underdog is about to come through. Stamen does well to get back up, but the round plays out pretty tamely with Stamen clearly feeling he has done the work in the earlier rounds to win the fight. Now, in my opinion, Lacerda won this fight as the underdog, but the first was very close. Now, somehow, Cody gets the nod, and the fight did go to distance as I predicted. And given the disparity in odds, nobody was expecting it to go to full three. Uh, I did call that right. But Lesoto was the heavy underdog in here, and I felt like he did enough. But now I sit at 3-1, and one, and I guess they took my lucky Nunes one back. I'm feeling quite salty about this at this point, though. I was pretty annoyed after that. Okay, now the next fight was between Jelton Almeida and uh, Shamil Abdul-Rakimov. Sorry if I'm trading off here. It's, it's been a long one. Now, I didn't give this fight much of a breakdown because I didn't expect this to be competitive in the slightest. And what do you know? I was 100% correct. Uh, Almeida took like a really big smack to the mouth early. And he, I could see he just thought, fuck this. Like he just picked the fat man up, dumped him down. It was very impressive, actually, considering that he's outweighed by like 30 pounds, I think. Something like that. Now, I think Almeida could potentially be a problem at this weight class, just based on how patiently and well the transitions were on the ground. Um, one thing that I did notice is that he does exert an awful lot of energy, but he was able to take breaks when he needed to, such was the level of dominance he had. Now, he might run into trouble with better competition down the line, but he managed to pop off some decent ground and pound towards the end of the round. For me, it wasn't quite a 10-8. Twitter seemed to unanimously call it an 10 -8. I didn't really agree with that because the fat lamb did manage to kind of defend and limit the offense against him. And, you know, Almeida knew what he needed to do. And, you know, the second was even more dominant. Like he picked him up again, dumped him, fucked him up. Um, Abdul Rakhnamov <laughs> did the best he could to survive. Um... Damn, these names get harder to say the, the more sleepy you get. Um, but yeah, he took too many unanswered shots on the ground. Um, uh, this will put Almeida into the top 15 now. And he's a he's a real problem, I think. Um, easy win for me, really. This was a cakewalk. And now I'm back to 4-1. and one, So I'm pretty happy with that. So quick... Quick one before I get into this fight. Um, there was another fight on the card between the younger with the younger Bonfim, um, but I didn't get to see him on the contender series. I've seen a few of his highlights. Um but uh, he was fighting against uh Laziz. He has some really nice wins, and on paper this looked like a an explosive matchup. I assumed Bonfim would win, and you know, he's looked very impressive from what I've seen. And fuck, I mean, this fight was over so quick. Uh, he came out hitting a few nice shots. Um, Laziz, uh, Laziz did, but before he could settle, he basically just got his neck snatched, locked up in a ghillie and tapped. So the younger Bonfin ended up winning that fight really comfortably. And I, I would run the risk of betting on that guy going forward. He looked really sensational. It was a good performance. He basically rolled him over into a mounted ghillie. And Lizzie's tap pretty much immediately. It was an excellent performance. 
Okay, so on to this fight now. I haven't missed my slides this time. This was deliberate. Uh, the next fight was between Thiago Moises and uh, Costa, who was stepping in on short notice. I had to do quite a lot of research on this guy who was making his de debut. Uh, from what I saw, he's very tough and durable. But Moises is clearly very good, so I called a Moises win, and I said it would be by either a late win or a dominant unanimous decision. So let's see how this went. Now, firstly, I just want to say it's really refreshing to see how happy Costa was. He was bouncing his way into the cage. He was clearly delighted to be there. But this kind of got soured a little bit. Uh, like, I was listening to the UFC commentary on Really Quiet. Um, because I often don't really love the commentary too much, even though I like these three. And at some point when he was walking down, bouncing down like happily, the uh, commentary team, I think it was Anik, he like reminded the, the, the audience that Costa had like this really bad viral experience in the cage where he was rear naked choked and he was knocked out for three minutes and there were actually fears for his life at that point. And I didn't really think that was a smart way to hype the fight. I mean, I know it's obviously true. It's something that happened in his history, but it seemed like very poor timing. Um, now, despite the fact that I picked against him anyway, this dude came in looking thrilled to be there. And he was, it, there was something really just awesome about the energy as he was screaming his name in Buffer's face. I know fighters sometimes do that, but there seemed to be an extra bit of energy to that. And I appreciated that. But what a terrible debut to get. I mean, Tiago Moises for your first fight in the UFC on short notice. That is a horrible, horrible... Um... Anyway. So Costa started off the fight with some pretty nice teeps. He demonstrated some really good takedown defense. He managed to sprawl like the first two before he finally got taken down. Now, Tiago did some really good work on top. He landed some decent ground and pounds. But Costa certainly wasn't just willing to settle in the position. He demonstrated some nice takedown defense on the grounds, and he even managed to, to land like a few nice elbows on the bottom. So, so far, this went exactly as I expected. So Moises was controlling, but Costa was clearly making it tough. Uh, towards the end of the round, they both stood and traded a bit. But, you know, Costa was clearly game, and he was calling for a scrap. He was screaming in there. He was clearly so up for this. Um... Now, I called it as a Tiago round, but, you know, Costa felt like he belonged in there. You know, this wasn't a total mismatch. Um, and now round two started with Costa avoiding another takedown brilliantly, if I remember. And he also managed to land a few shots on the feet. He also, like, hit a few teeps, and he's again, seemed to be really enjoying himself in there. Now... This is where the beginning of the end came, where Tiago basically landed a really nice double leg and had nice control on top. Now, Costa spent a lot of the round trying to escape positions and avoiding some dangerous um, some dangerous submission attempts. Um, but Tiago basically switched tactics at that point when he wasn't having much success and just started blasting shots to the body. And eventually, uh, Costa relented allowing uh, Moises to take the back. And then he locked up a rear naked choke and got a submission win. It was a nice performance from both men, to be fair. Um, I really hope they keep Costa around, really. It was a tough debut. And what pissed me off about the ending, I, I almost forgot to mention this, was Moises decides to call out Paddy Pimlet, which to me, like, Jesus, that was such a bitch move. Like, Pimlet isn't even ranked. And everyone knows how shit he is now. I mean, I always knew, but the rest of the world know now. After his last crappy performance, it was just a terrible pussy call-out. And I hope as a reward, he gets someone like Sarukian or uh, someone like that instead next. So, so it was a nice fight overall. It was well won by Thiago. And I'm 5-1, baby. Looking really good so far. Okay, now the next fight. Oh... The next fight. This was between Robocop and Ferreira. Now, firstly, I was watching some build-up earlier, which I never normally do. And there was a really nice piece on Rodriguez. He was talking about his father. And I, I felt almost bad for subtly implying that he was a juiced-up monkey in my predictions. Um, 
it was a really nice piece without the soft story elements that I sometimes hate about reality TV. Um, I did pick him to win by TKO. And now I, and I did say in the build-up that this was a dangerous one and to essentially skip it because they're both dangerous. But I expected it to be quick either way. And I said that the play to make was to take under a round and a half. And I definitely wasn't wrong on this one. Now, now Robocop got clipped really early and he looked tentative, but he started to look a little bit more comfortable as the round progressed with Ferreira softening him, softening him up with nice leg kicks. Um, and yeah, then Robocop started to look a little more comfortable. He was picking shots at range and timing shots really well. And Ferreira was looking a little bit sloppy in there. He looked like somebody who hadn't had a camp and was just coming in there, which he was. Um, so this this enabled Robocop to catch him with some nice straight jabs as he came in. Now, this, the fight basically turned when Ferreira hit a really hard leg kick. And that sent Rodriguez down, and this really changed the tone from here. So both men were like wildly exchanging next to the cage. And Ferreira hits an absolutely stunning shot out of nowhere. Busting Robocop open, which is something I also predicted might happen, and just knocked him the fuck out. It was a really nice finish, but I think this guy Bruno has a lot to work on. If he's going to make ripples, you know, he's got, he's got a lot to work on. But it was a, a really impressive short notice de debut and a lovely finish. And this took me to five and two. So I'm like, oh, this is not great. Not a good record. But anyway, we press on onto the next fight up the card. And to be fair, Rodriguez seems like a really nice fella, but he's not troubling anyone in the top 15. Okay, now the next fight on the card was between... is It was a light heavyweight bout between Iho Pateria and Shogun Hua. Now, I called Iho to win this one, and I felt pretty confident about this going into it. Um, I felt that a loss for Pateria was... He was probably going to amount to nothing in the UFC and probably was going to get cut. So let's see how it went. Oh, by the way, it was really nice of them to show like old Shogun who are highlights. It was very sporting of them. You know, he hasn't looked like that in years, but, you know, fair enough. And he, like the disparity of the Shogun they showed in the vi vignettes and Shogun walking down was fuck, man. He looks so out of shape. Um, so I would have been amazed if I'd managed to get egg on my face for this one. Um, so just as I said, just as I said that, like Shogun walks over to him and boots him so hard in the leg and then catches Ihor with a nice shot. Um, now this kind of forced Ihor into defensive mode a little bit. He seemed to be a little bit slow getting started and he looked a little jittery in there. Now really and truly Shogun had an opportunity here to take advantage um, of his opponent's nerves, but unfortunately he didn't do that. And it was pretty much conclusive after that. Uh, Ihor started to walk him down. He landed some really decent shots. Shogun was hurt to the eye. And then Ihor landed a really nice shot to wobble him. And then he went in for the kill. Um, he finally rushed into finish and the ref called it off. Now the shame was that he managed to uh, to spoil it with a really cringy, silly hand gesture. You know, he looked like a like your five year old's I don't know favorite retarded anime hero or something, and his post fight speech was just equally stupid, um, especially as he didn't really read the situation that well. It was a sad end for a legend that should have. I mean, you know, who I should have quit years ago, um, but at least he went out in Brazil, which I guess you could maybe see as a good thing. Maybe it's worse. I don't know. But yeah, Eagle by one by TKO, which is exactly what I predicted. And yeah, um, I now had a 6-2 record, so things are starting to pick up again. Now, the next fight was uh, Johnny Walker versus um, Paul Craig. Um, now, now, to be honest, on paper, this is this should be an easy one. But as I mentioned, I do love Walker, but he's a fucking dumb guy and you know he's got the kind of chin that gets nervous when you know wind is forecast wait I, i'd noticed as well at the beginning of just before this fight there was like a, a they showed like a live image of christ the redeemer obviously with the fight being in brazil 
And Christ the Redeemer had a UFC strap over his shoulder. Like, I'm not the most religious guy in the world, but that can't be okay, right? That was, I don't know, that was a, that was a strange decision. Um, anyway, this was a very weird and very brief fight. Uh, pretty much nothing happened for the first few minutes. There were a few leg kicks exchanged. And then out of nowhere, like, Walker throws up a leg, which Craig catches. And then he basically just stands there. Like like he was frozen like an absolute plum. And then Walker just is thinking, thanks very much, and just absolutely clocks him. Um, and what was funny is as he clocks him, Craig's still clinging onto the leg. Now, any normal human would let the leg go at this point and try and scramble. But he holds onto the leg like a, like some kind of idiot, like some kind of wally. Um, and, yeah, I mean, bear in mind, this is the guy that beat Ankalaev who just got a shot, and Hill, who's getting a shot later in the card, which is just so incredible to me. But anyway, this was an easy win for Walker, who just pretty much, once his leg was caught, he just hammer-fisted Craig to the floor. Um, But yeah, like I said, this was a great matchup for him coming in. They're both brain-dead, and... But trust me, as much as I like the guy, um, this is the last win that Johnny Walker is going to get against a ranked opponent. A ranked opponent, to be clear. So it was good for me, though, that, you know, that then took me to 7-2 on the card, I think it was. I might be wrong about that. I might be counting wrong. I think I missed one somewhere. Um, I think I'm actually 8-2 at, at this point, but I'll go back at some point and check it out later. Um, now onto the fight at women's flyweight. Now, first of all, before I get into this, it was really nice to see Jose Aldo in the house, but it reminded me of why I despise, um, Marab the Goblin so much. We could have seen Jose retire on this card instead, but that didn't happen as a result of Marab giving the worst, most drab performance. Now this fight was one that I was really, really confident about. I didn't break it down hardly at all. I expected Andrade to just beat the shit out of her and finish her pretty early. Now, I know I sound like a really big hater of women's MMA, and that's because I am, but I expected this one to be entertaining enough. You know, Andrade is actually very good, and she's one of the very few female fighters I think are actually skilled. And Murphy, Murphy is not completely terrible. Um, so anyway... I ended up feeling to take that back instantly. I don't want to completely shit on Murphy here because she did amazingly well to survive. But fuck me, this was a horrible mismatch. It kind of reminded me of when Holloway beat the fuck out of Qatar for five rounds and he was just too dumb to quit. Like, Murphy had heart out there. But there was no, there's no easier way of saying than this was a third round ass whipping. She had 18 fell takedowns, 18. And Andrade more than tripled her significant strike records. And she's been in five round fights. So try and wrap your head around that. This was three rounds and she over tripled her output in any other fight. Um, it kind of came, but became pretty hard to watch by the end. It was a pummeling. It was a beat down, a thrashing. It was a total and utter destruction. Um, this was worse than a one punch KO. Uh, it was a prolonged, humiliating beating. I said it would be, and at least it was entertaining because of that, you know. On another note, in terms of the division, as good as Andrade is, she's way too small for this weight class. And she already got fucked up by Valentina. And this is why Andrade is in such a difficult position, because she wins the fight, clearly by unanimous decision. And then she calls out Zhang, who's in the weight class below, and who I really rate, by the way. But Zhang already beat the brakes off her. Like, as decent as Andrade is, or as good as Andrade is, she got fucking destroyed by Zhang. And, yeah, I just felt like that was such a stupid call-out, and it just kind of shows where the women's divisions are at. Anyway, it took me to, I think it was 9-2, and two actually. There's one fight that I'm missing. Um, like I said, I'm exhausted, and I will go and recount later on. Now, the next fight on the card, we had... Burns versus Magnia. Now, I had Burns by decision. Now, Burns was the overwhelming favorite in this one. 
Um, but I, I honestly, despite how the fight ended up playing out, which I'll get to in a minute, I thought the odds really disrespected Magni. I mean, the guy's been around for ages. I did pick Burns to win by decision. And I thought he'd win in a devastating win. But, um, and I think it would be it would be better for Burns to win just because it leaves us a nice contender in weighing. Um, by the way, they showed the main card for UFC 284, then Makashev and Volkanovski card. And oh man, that main card is terrible on paper. It might turn out to be an absolute banger, but on paper, it's a horrible card. And I don't even know how they managed to fuck that up. Like it's in Australia. They had months and months to plan for it. And we just end up with some doo-doo in the main event. It was terrible. Anyway, um, now I kind of got this one both right and wrong. Like Magni started the whole fight working, sorry, started the first round working at range. He was uh, forcing Burns to up the aggression. Then Burns got a beautiful takedown. And after after a little bit of a feeling out process, he really had Magni in trouble. Um, now Magni could not work his way up. Burns struggled a little bit at first to pass the guard. But finally when he did, with a little over a minute to go, and this was a really uneventful round, by the way. It took a good one to, you know, but like, you know, Burns just pretty much laid on top of him and didn't expel any energy at first. And then I mentioned, you know, so I mentioned before the fight that Burns didn't have many submission wins. I think his last one was in 2019, despite being seen as a BJG, BJJ, uh, you know, um, a BJJ fighter. But to my surprise, he locked one up on Magni and Magni taps immediately. Um, so the story of the fight was, you know, Burns just got him down way too easily. And it was a really impressive, easy win against a really good contender. Now, because of where Burns is, is in the division, it didn't really need a call out. Maybe Colby will be interesting, potentially. But whenever you get a chance to call someone out after a dominant win, it's a wasted opportunity if you don't. So turning out, it's been a pretty good card for me with two fights to go. Um, I believe I'm now at... a. 10 and 2. It was 10. I'm, I'm, I know I've, I've skipped a, a fight down the line here. Um, so yeah, if you've been watching my prediction fight earlier on in the week, you would have made some serious money. Okay, now for me, it was onto the hardest part, fight of the card to pick. And I think easily the most split on the internet and among MMA commentary channels. And that's Moreno versus Figueredo. Now, firstly, I must say, it takes big, big brass balls for Moreno to go into Brazil and to try and get the belt back there. I, like, not to sound funny, but I hope USADA had been really busy in these last few weeks. Um, you know, we've already been blessed with over an hour of these two men inside the cage. And... And, you know, especially, like... I think they, they've spent um, an hour or over an hour in the cage together, which is pretty much unprecedented at this level. Um, now, I predicted this one to go the distance or for Moreno to win by potentially a late stoppage. But either way, you know, this was the end of an era at flyweight one way or another. So let's talk about what went down and what for me was the real main event of the evening and possibly the last two fight between these two men. Now, the fight started off without much of a feeling out process. I mean, Marino took Figgy down almost in immediately. And he almost got caught in a ghillie for doing it. It was a bit careless. Um, the fight then got back to the feet. And the tone was really, really clear from the offset. Marino was going to be the busier. And Figgy was going to just look for the shot, the shot to end it. Um, now, Marino kind of stifled him a little bit by softening the body a little. He hit a few nice shots. And he was working really well at range. Um, it was a close round, but I think with the two takedowns and the more significant shots, Moreno clearly took round one for me. There was very little to separate them. Um, it's important to point out as well that there was a blatantly illegal shot right at the end of the first round by Figgy. And it's not the first time he's done something a bit dirty in a fight with, uh, with Moreno. Now, the second round, uh, Figgy immediately gets taken down and he managed to... He managed like a little control time, being strong on top, as in Moreno did. 
Um, it didn't take long for the fight to be standing again. And it was Moreno that got it standing. He managed to get back to his feet. And what was really interesting to me is that as they got up, Figgy looks really dejected at this point. Um, he looked a bit defeated. And I really noticed there was something in his eyes there. Um, so Moreno then started investing a lot in the legs and the body, which is always a smart choice. And then Figgy kind of managed to throw Moreno down. And I was thinking, oh, you know, another takedown again. But somehow he gets like swept from the bottom. And Moreno once again ends the second round on top after escaping a, a gilly. So this gave them two minutes to work and or gave Moreno two minutes to work. And Moreno did really well to keep him down despite not being too busy. It was really hard for me not to call it 2-0 at this point. But apparently, retrospectively, once the fight was over, it turns out that all the judges gave Figgy round two, which I have no fucking idea why. Um, I mean, Moreno had three minutes of dominance on the ground. Uh, if that doesn't make it a conclusive win for one person, I don't know what does. Outside of knockdowns, of course. Now, the third round actually started off really well for Figgy. And he looked like he was trying to change the game plan a bit and go to the body. Now, Moreno looked a little tired as a result of this. And he began to be a little bit more hesitant. I wasn't sure if it was a sign that he was starting to crumble, but it felt like the tide was turning. But then out of nowhere, Moreno catches Figgy with a really nice, like, I think it was a left hand, but a knuckle. Um, now, Figgy tried to grab his eye and call for a stoppage or a uh, a break for an eye poke, which he rightly did not get because it turned out to not be an eye poke at all. Um, and then from there, Moreno got Figgis and, uh, Davidson Figueroa to the ground and hit some really nasty ground and pound, hit some elbows, and he caused further damage to Figueroa's eye. And this, for me, was the most dominant round of the fight. Now, basically, when, when Figgy stood up at the end of the round, head back to his stool, I knew it was over. Like, he felt like he knew... I just felt like he knew it was over and that there was no way he was going to overcome Moreno on that day. Um, but I was pleased. You know, it got me up to... I've got on record here that it was 11-2. I think it says 10-2 here. But I'm almost certain it was 11-2 on the card. And But what really surprised me was, like, it wasn't the fact that I got this right that was so surprising because I just genuinely believe Moreno was better. It was the post-fight speech that was even more fucking remarkable. So for those of you who haven't seen my breakdown of flyweight, and if you haven't, please go and watch it. I not only predicted the fight outcome, but I predicted that Figgy would start making excuses about his weight and that he would effectively retire from flyweight and announce about uh, a move up to bantamweight. And that's exactly what he did. I could not have nailed it better. Um, anyway, in, in some ways it was a bit of a disappointing end to the rivalry, but I was confident that Moreno was just that little bit better in all areas, and ultimately I was proven right. So the division can now move on, and this really helps up set up Pantoja, who has two wins over Moreno already. Some will be disappointed with the fight itself, but I thought it was a, a conclusive end, and now I'm sitting at 10-2. Um, and on to the main, well, it was 11-2. We'll say 10-2 for now, and I'll we'll do it that way. I'll say it's 10-2, and then we'll go back and retrospectively check it later on, and I'll maybe alter it in the comments if I'm correct. Now, then we got onto the main event, and I'm fucking buzzing. You know, worst case now, I'm thinking I'm ending 11-3 and three or 10-3 and three or whatever it might be. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear that... Um, First of all, this was a really ridiculous fight. Glover should have... He definitely didn't deserve a shot. He basically turned down Ankalev, Ankalaev, but didn't turn down Yan. But then didn't fight either of them. And then now he got to fight number seven, which is just total bullshit. But, you know, as far as I'm concerned, both these guys, either of them can hold on to the belt. Because when Yeri comes back, he's going to snatch it back anyway, so who cares? Um... Now, I did pick Glover as a massive underdog. Or no, no, well, not a massive underdog. He was a slight underdog. I'm exaggerating there. Um, but let's see how this fight played out. Uh, I can't remember the last time I was this meh about a main event. But, you know, whatever. We crack on. Now, Hill started really well. 
He was headhunting as expected. He managed distant well and hit Glover with some shots that really stung him. But most significantly, Glover had five takedowns stuffed in that first round. And he was really looking his age in there. Uh, there was a pretty bad hill, uh, eye poke on Hill, but he managed to dominate the round regardless on the feet, and he found them much cleaner shots. Now, Glover did get a few through the hands, but it was a clear one nil to Hill. Now, Glover was actually a little bit busier at the start of round two, and he got his eye poke returned, so there was an eye poke back there. Now, Glover wanted this restarted quickly, and he was clearly banking on Hill to gas, that's what I think the reasoning was behind that. But then, I mean, and this was, you're going to find, this was the story of the entire fight. Hill then wobbled him with a really slick head kick. And then he just started teeing off on Glover. Um, it was another dominant round for Hill, but I say, yeah, yeah. And, um, where are we? Um, sorry, I'm really drifting off here. It's here. It's so late. Um, Anyway, so the head kicks were a problem and they would continue to be so. Um, now, after the head kick, um, Hill manages to get some really nasty ground and pound. But, you know, Glover's not complete. I thought the fight was going to be stopped then. Um, then Glover managed to get him down with two minutes left. And I thought that was huge for the fight, some momentum, or I thought it was going to be. He got some nice ground and pound for a minute. But Hill managed to escape, which was just huge. So it was a great second round that swung back and forth, but I still think Hill had the round. It was barely, but it was a 2-0 two two Hill, I thought, at this point. You know, Glover filled with a takedown at the start of the third, and then both men are just running out of juice. You could just see it. Um, Hill was controlling with nice jabs, but then another just brutal head kick. Um, then more ground and pound. And again, I this was the worst, probably the worst battering of all of them at this point. Um, I thought they were going to stop the fight, but somehow, and I think if it wasn't a title fight, it would have been stopped. But Glover manages to survive. Hill gets back up to standing. Then Glover miraculously spends the rest of the third going for it, but I still have it 3-0 Hill at this point. Um, on the stool, Glover looked cut to pieces, like his eyes were just completely destroyed. And I thought they were going to end it there and then. But nope, miraculously, he gets up. Um, then again, fourth and fifth round, very similar story. Um, you know, he goes for, he gets caught by a couple of head kicks that Hill threw in. And to, to be fair, place of, well, both of them, they showed really civilian, like resilient, uh, sh uh, chins and just scrapped all the way to the end. Um, it was a pretty much a beat down. I had Hill four nil up or maybe three, one at worst, but um honestly it yeah it could have been 4-1 it was domination and then Glover despite getting the beating of his life somehow in round five he manages to take Hill down and I know that everyone in the group is like that collective gasp of is this going to be the greatest comeback of all time it wasn't um you know Hill ended up some you know reversing it but you know that was definitely is you know that was definitely the end you know and you know once he missed that opportunity it was over from there um the thing is Jamal Jamala Hill is now the, the the light heavyweight champion and that's a very strange thing to say I felt like either winner would have been not great for the division anyway but one thing that really made it nice for me was when Jamala Hill was essentially just bawling his eyes out at the end um he was genuinely emotional and you just saw how much it meant to him and, you know, I am a total asshole, but that kind of moves me a little bit. I was like, you know what? That's nice because Glover winning it made no sense. He's 100 years old and he's never going to defend it. So what would have been the point? He would have probably won the fight and then retired. And then, you know, the, the division would have been fucked again. I'm not sure if Glover actually retired because I didn't watch the end. Because as you can hear, I'm exhausted. I wanted to get this video done. But that was a nice way to end it. So basically, I ended up finishing the card with either a 10-3 or 11-3 record. So what that essentially means is that for the end of the year, or for the end of the first two months, I'm standing at a record of 16-7 or 17-7. I'm not sure.
battle, which um, I think it's it's either sixteen seven or seventeen seven. But either way, you know, that's um that's over two thirds of correct predictions to start off with, and some of them were spookily accurate. So I will definitely, definitely take it. Um, wonderful, like most of the best out there are getting you know in and around. I think the best last year was MMA Guru, and he was at like sixty. 67 68% which is obviously very very hard to maintain and i don't expect to be anywhere near that by the end of the um by the end of the year but, you know i'm hovering at around i think 70 or something now something in that region 72 73 so which is a really great start so i'm really pleased with that so um once again i just want to say thanks to everyone for tuning in this was a long one and i'm going to have to work on my stamina because I was literally nodding off as I was reading this out. So, um, well, not reading this out, but just even saying reading this out. I was even nodding off speaking this out. So, um, yeah, this was a this was a tough slog and a tough card. Decent enough card overall, but yeah, I'm glad it's over and at least we have some, you know, some clarity in the light heavyweight division. Anyway, I'm gonna sign off before I totally pass out. It's seven a.m. here. I will be making a prediction fight card I'm hoping for Wednesday, if I have time. But you will get one at some point this week. And then I'll follow up with a reaction card as well. So thank you to everyone once again. And have a wonderful rest of your weekend.